How is the death of the universe possible if the universe is infinite? The concept of the universe's death is more about its state and less about its size or infiniteness. Several theories predict how the universe could end, but they often focus on the thermodynamic properties, energy distribution, and the fate of matter over time, rather than the universe ceasing to exist entirely. Here are a few scenarios based on current scientific understanding. Heat death or the big freeze. This is the most widely accepted scenario based on the second law of thermodynamics. Over trillions of years, it's theorized that the universe will reach a state of maximum entropy, where all energy is evenly distributed and no work can be performed. The universe would be cold and dead, with all stars burned out, and every bit of energy spread out thinly across an ever-expanding cosmos. Big Rip This theory suggests that the expansion of the universe, driven by dark energy, could continue to accelerate indefinitely. Eventually, this acceleration would become so powerful that it would tear apart galaxies, stars, planets, and finally molecules and atoms themselves. Big Crunch The opposite of the Big Bang, this theory proposes that the expansion of the universe could reverse, causing the universe to collapse back on itself into a singularity. This scenario is less favored now because observations suggest the universe's expansion is accelerating, not slowing down. Big Bounce this theory combines aspects of the Big Crunch with the idea of cyclic universes. It suggests that after a Big Crunch, the universe could bounce back and start expanding again, potentially leading to an infinite cycle of universes being born, dying, and being reborn. The concept of an infinite universe doesn't contradict these scenarios because infinity here refers more to the spatial extent rather than its lifespan or the distribution of matter and energy within it. Even in an infinite universe, the distribution of energy can become so even that no meaningful activity can take place, leading to a death of sorts in terms of the universe's ability to host life or undergo change. How can energy be distributed uniformly in an infinite universe? If the universe is infinite, then there must be infinitely many regions where energy is not evenly distributed. The concept of energy being evenly distributed in an infinite universe indeed presents a paradox when taken at face value. The idea primarily stems from thermodynamics applied to a more understandable, finite model of the universe. However, applying these principles to an infinite universe requires some nuance. Local versus global uniformity. In an infinite universe, energy could become evenly distributed on a local scale, within observable regions, rather than globally. The observable universe, the part we can see and measure, might reach a state of maximum entropy, where energy within this region is evenly spread out. Beyond our observable universe, conditions could vary wildly, but those variations would have no effect on the state of entropy within our observable limits. The Horizon Problem This issue is also related to the cosmological horizon problem, which the theory of cosmic inflation addresses. The Horizon Problem questions how parts of the universe are too far apart to have exchanged light, or any information, since the Big Bang appears to be at the same temperature. Cosmic inflation theory suggests that the universe expanded exponentially in a very short time period after the Big Bang, smoothing out any initial irregularities over a vast region. In this context, an even distribution doesn't necessarily mean perfectly uniform across infinity, but sufficiently uniform within the observable universe due to its rapid early expansion. The Role of Dark Energy The current accelerated expansion of the universe, driven by dark energy, adds another layer of complexity. If dark energy continues to accelerate the universe's expansion, it could lead to scenarios like the Big Freeze or the Big Rip. In these cases, while locally, within our observable universe, energy might become more evenly distributed as stars burn out and matter spreads thin, the global picture across an infinite universe might be far more complicated and beyond our current understanding. Theoretical Limits The discussion of energy distribution in an infinite universe touches on the limits of our current theories. General relativity, quantum mechanics, and thermodynamics are all based on observations and experiments within the observable universe. Extrapolating these theories to an infinite cosmos involves assumptions that may not hold universally. In summary, when physicists talk about the universe reaching thermal equilibrium or heat death, they're often referring to the observable universe. The concept of an infinite universe introduces complexities that challenge our current understanding 
suggesting that the true nature of the entire cosmos could be far more intricate than our local observations can reveal. If the universe is everything, then there is nothing external for it to expand into. But we know for sure that it does expand. So the question is, what exactly is it expanding into? According to the theory of cosmic inflation, the universe was once filled with large amounts of energy. It was similar to hypothetical dark energy but much greater in magnitude. It made the universe expand faster and faster. As a result, the universe was getting colder and emptier. And then, after growing this way for a very long, possibly infinite amount of time, most of this energy got converted into matter and radiation, which triggered the Big Bang. The Big Bang was the moment when the whole universe was squeezed into a tiny, super hot, and extremely dense ball we call a singularity. And all of a sudden, when it was less than one second old, this tiny ball started to unpack at speeds we can't even imagine. It was so hot that particles were moving extremely fast, crashing into one another and creating pairs with their opposites, like matter and antimatter. When the universe was a hundredth of a billionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second in age, it experienced an incredible burst of expansion that we know as inflation. At that moment, the universe doubled in size at the speed of light. And after that, it doubled in size at least 90 more times, growing from a subatomic size formation to a golf-sized structure almost instantly. After this burst of inflation, according to NASA, the growth of the universe continued, but it slowed down. As the universe kept expanding, it started to cool down, and matter formed. One second after the Big Bang, and the universe was already filled with neutrons, protons, electrons, anti-electrons, photons, and neutrinos. If we somehow managed to observe the universe when it was just a trillionth of a second old, we'd see that it was the size of Earth's orbit around the Sun. When the universe was a mere one second old, it was too hot for nuclear fusion to occur. At that time, its radius was just 10 light years, which is enough to enclose the nine nearest star systems we know about. When the universe was one year old, it was smaller than our home galaxy and unbelievably hot, finally hot enough to start nuclear fusion. When the universe was three years old, it was roughly the size of the Milky Way galaxy when matter started to dominate radiation, which happened when the universe was around 10,000 years old. The size of the universe was about 10 million light years. It would be easy to think of the Big Bang and the resulting expanding universe as an ordinary explosion, where everything is expanding from a central point. But it's not a good analogy. There's a better one. Look at the surface of an inflating balloon. It'll be a two-dimensional equivalent of our three-dimensional universe. The balloon fabric will be space, these dots marked on its surface will represent galaxies. You see, they're moving apart as the balloon expands, but it happens only because the fabric, representing space itself, is expanding. The galaxies aren't moving on their own, and there's no central point for the expansion. The balloon is expanding into the third dimension, and that's where the analogy is getting trickier. Does it mean that our universe is expanding into some higher dimension? If there's no larger multiverse and our universe is all there is, then there's nothing outside of it. Not even a vacuum, which is still part of space. It means there's no point in asking what the universe expands into. If there was a two-dimensional being on the surface of our expanding balloon, they would be able to observe all distances in its surface 2D world getting larger. But they wouldn't see the third dimension into which the balloon is expanding. The same goes for us. Three-dimensional creatures, we see the distances between galaxies growing, meaning the inflation of space, but we can't perceive additional space dimensions, into which the expansion is moving beyond our three. Even if space is indeed expanding into some higher dimension, our current knowledge of physics doesn't allow us to find out anything about it. It's likely to be beyond our comprehension. The morning is cloudy, but it isn't raining. So, you grab your bag and head off to work. You're halfway there when it starts drizzling. Then raining. Then pouring. There's only one thought in your head as you're dashing through wet streets towards your office building. If only I could hop in a time machine and go back in time. 
I'd have put that umbrella in my bag. Unfortunately, going back in time is not possible. But guess what? We still managed to travel in time. But let's start from the very beginning. More than a hundred years ago, a famous scientist called Albert Einstein, I bet you've seen his most popular photo, came up with a theory about how time works. He gave it a nice little scientific name, the theory of relativity. According to it, space and time are linked together. Another point is that our universe has a set speed limit. Nothing can move faster than the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles per second. Okay, you may say, but what does it have to do with time travel? Well, the theory of relativity also claims that the faster you move, the slower you experience time. And several experiments prove this to be true. For example, let's say you have two clocks set to the exact same time. You leave one clock at home and take another one with you while traveling by plane. What's important here is the fact that the plane is going in the same direction as Earth. After your plane finishes its flight around the world, you can compare the time on the two clocks. You find out that the clock that traveled with you is a bit behind the clock that remained on the ground. Because of this, GPS clocks are corrected. GPS satellites travel around our planet at tremendous speeds, around 8,700 miles per hour, and more than 12,000 miles above the surface of Earth. This speed slows GPS satellite clocks down, but the altitude speeds them up. As a result, the clocks on GPS satellites experience time at a rate that is slightly faster than one second per second. And if this difference in time wasn't corrected, you wouldn't be able to use GPS to figure out your exact location. In any case, this is probably the closest thing we have to time travel. You see, our planet is constantly moving around the sun at an average speed of 67,000 miles per hour. The sun, along with the entire solar system, is, in turn, circling the center of our home Milky Way galaxy at a staggering 140 miles per second. And the Milky Way itself is also moving. It's spinning at a speed of 130 miles per second. Those are some really dizzying numbers. And now, imagine that in order to get to the past, all this space matter must also turn back and return to its original position. Just admit it, it's absolutely impossible. By the way, even though we can't exactly travel back in time, we can look at the past, thanks to NASA's space telescopes. They help us see stars and galaxies that are insanely far away. It takes the light coming from them ages to reach Earth. That's why when you observe those distant worlds, you see what they looked like a long time ago. Now, what if time travel was somehow possible? Wouldn't all the fun be spoiled by the time travel paradox? You know, like finding yourself in the past and accidentally preventing your parents from meeting each other? The problem is that Einstein's theory of general relativity theoretically allows a person to travel back in time and come in contact with their past self, which can potentially endanger their existence. But you can breathe out. Some scientists at the University of Queensland have recently claimed that this paradox might not actually exist. They say that even if you made some changes in the past, the timeline would self-correct anyway. In other words, it would still ensure that whatever event sent you back in time would still happen. One more study claims that even if some changes happened in the past, they wouldn't drastically alter the future. If the multiverse theory is correct, ours is not the only one out there. Which is as interesting as it is scary, right? Now, not every scientist is on board with this mind-bending concept. And let's be honest, the idea of actually making contact with these parallel universes sounds about as probable as winning the lottery while riding a unicycle. But hold on tight, because this strange concept isn't just limited to the realms of fiction anymore. Believe it or not, a bunch of scientific theories actually support the existence of parallel universes. And let me tell you, it's a topic that stirs up quite the debate in scientific groups. Now picture this. 
The universe we live in is mind-numbingly vast. We're talking billions, some say even trillions, of galaxies swirling around, each packed with an almost uncountable number of stars. Some brainiacs studying the universe's shape suggest that its diameter could span a staggering 7 billion light years. Others even argue that it might be infinite. Could there be more out there than meets the eye? Well, real scientific theories are exploring the possibility of universes existing alongside, beyond, or even mirroring our own. These intriguing concepts of multiverses and parallel worlds often intertwine with other, more familiar scientific ideas like the Big Bang, string theory, and quantum mechanics. In order for us to figure out what's out there, we have to rely on the information we're a bit more confident in, right? Let's rewind the cosmic clock about 13.7 billion years ago. Everything we're able to see today was squished into a minuscule singularity. Then, if the Big Bang theory is to be trusted, it all went boom. The universe inflated with a speed faster than that of light everywhere, within less than a second. The way the universe went pop has led some clever researchers to ponder the existence of more than one universe. They question whether that sudden growth ended everywhere at the same time. While the expansion ceased for everything we're able to see from Earth 13.8 billion years ago, cosmic inflation might still be ongoing in some other mysterious corners. Some theoretical physicists say that as inflation ends in one place, a new balloon universe forms. But here's the catch. You can't just hop from one bubble to another like intergalactic tourists. These bubble universes are expanding indefinitely, and their edges are zooming away from us faster than light can travel. And here's where things get even more confusing. Let's say we somehow manage to reach the edge of our local balloon and encounter the next universe. Well, those same theoretical physicists mentioned that the neighboring universe could be a whole different ball game. It might have completely different laws of physics, making it a bizarre place for us. Following the same idea, some say that in this vast multiverse of bubble universes, there might be other life forms just like us. The problem is, we're getting farther away from them with each passing moment, and our paths will never cross. Other super smart researchers out there are trying to connect parallel universes with quantum mechanics. Now, quantum mechanics is basically the fancy math behind teeny tiny particles. According to it, these particles can exist in multiple states all at once. They call it a wave function that holds all the crazy options. But here's the catch. When we observe these particles, we only see one outcome. It's like the universe keeps playing hide and seek with us. Now there's this theory called the many worlds theory that says whenever we observe one outcome, another universe pops up where a different outcome becomes real. It's like our universe acts as a giant tree, constantly branching into countless versions of itself. These alternate universes can't mingle though, so you wouldn't even know if there are a bunch of other yous living slightly, or totally, different lives. This many worlds theory is pretty bold and a bit hard to prove or disprove. And that's not great for science because scientists love to test and experiment with their ideas. But if there's infinite space out there, why wouldn't there be infinite universes too? Try to imagine the universe as this giant cosmic playground. Some specialists believe that if it's indeed never ending, then there's only a limited number of ways that its building blocks can arrange themselves. Eventually, they have to repeat certain patterns. If this is true, then it may be possible that somewhere out there, there might be another version of you living the exact same life, even down to what you had for brunch yesterday. Did we ever have any proof of these supposed parallel universes? Well, some say we did. Have you heard the tale of the mysterious man from Taured? It's the story of a man that ended up at a Japanese airport saying he was from a totally unknown country called Taured. Now, some folks think it's proof of time travel, while others believe it's evidence he came from a different universe altogether. As much as you'd like to believe the story to be factual, the tricky part is this Torrid place. There's a reason you haven't heard of it. There's no Torrid to be found, whether in the present day or back in the 1950s when this supposed incident happened. After the airport incident, the man just vanished into thin air a day after arriving in Japan. Poof, gone forever. 
Let's rewind to that fateful day in July 1954 when the man from Torred supposedly landed in Tokyo. Descriptions paint him as a bearded, French-speaking man. Nothing too outlandish so far, right? Depending on who's telling the story, things start to diverge a bit. In one version, when the man hands over his passport to get stamped, the Japanese officer's eyes bulge out. While the passport looked legit, the country listed as Torrid isn't recognized by anyone, including the officer and other officials. Naturally, they take our Torrid visitor away for a little Q&A session. In another version, the man straight up tells the officer he's from Torrid and shows him the passport when he doesn't buy it. Our man from Tared then started trying to convince the officers that his homeland is the real deal. According to him, Tored sat snugly between France and Spain and would have been around for about 1,000 years. To prove his point, he even points to the area on a map that matches the Principality of Andorra. Obviously, things took a mysterious turn. The officers decided to hold the man in custody, suspecting he might be up to no good. They put him up in a nearby hotel for the night, but not without stationing two people outside his room to keep an eye on things. Can you guess what happens next? Drum roll, please. When the officers showed up the next morning, ready to continue their investigation, the man had vanished without a trace. No sign of escape, and to make matters even more puzzling, all his personal documents have magically vanished too. What if the man from Torrid was a time traveler, or an intergalactic adventurer? Some have even delved into the realms of science fiction to explain this bizarre event, and you won't believe the number of people on the internet who've latched onto it as evidence for alternate realities. One of the weirdest ideas suggests that the man accidentally stumbled into a parallel dimension and ended up at the Japanese airport. In that parallel universe, there's an Earth just like ours, but instead of Andorra, they call it Torrid over there. Another idea floating around was that the man was a time traveler from the future. Sorry to break it to you, but the most reasonable explanation for the whole story of the man from Tord is that someone's imagination went wild. Since there are many versions of the same story, it's probable people just kept adding outrageous details to the case, to make it more sensational. The whole story simply snowballed into an urban legend, and there's little to no reason to believe we've once seen a time traveler or intergalactic hitchhiker right here on Earth. It's been more than a year since the James Webb Telescope, which had taken over 20 years to complete, was launched. And for such a relatively short time, the ultra-modern and most powerful in history piece of equipment has already made plenty of discoveries. By observing the universe at infrared wavelength, James Webb lets us see things no other telescope has ever shown before. The primary goal of this incredible piece of equipment is to study the formation of galaxies and stars that appeared in the early universe. For example, look at the closest to us stellar nursery, a region of space where new stars get born. NASA has shared an image from James Webb that shows a small star-forming region. If you look at the picture attentively, you'll see jets bursting from infant stars. Around them, different colored clouds of cosmic dust are colliding with one another. The view is mesmerizing. The red dust consists of molecular hydrogen. You can also notice that some stars have something like shadows. Those hint at the creation of what will later become planets. At first sight, the image may seem chaotic, but astronomers claim that it's a relatively small and quiet stellar nursery in comparison to some others. Many young stars there are similar in size to our sun, or a bit smaller. The photo itself was taken with the help of Webb's near-infrared camera, NearCam. It's the observatory's primary camera that snaps images of the cosmos in two different infrared ranges. Another amazing discovery the Webb telescope has made is smoke molecules in a distant galaxy. It's the first time such molecules have been discovered so far away from our planet. The galaxy in question lies 12.3 billion light-years away from Earth. It most likely formed about one and a half billion years after the Big Bang. Despite such a huge distance between the galaxy and our planet, scientists have managed to detect chemical compounds found in soot or smoke, and it's quite a big deal since it has pushed the record for detecting similar complex molecules back by around a billion years. This study has also confirmed the sheer power of the coolest piece of space equipment of all time. 
it managed to make this discovery despite the fact that the spectrometer needed for the measurements didn't perform to the fullest after having experienced a sudden and surprising degradation. The James Webb Telescope has also helped to boost our understanding of exoplanets. Those are planets orbiting stars other than our own Sun. At the beginning of 2023, the observatory spotted its first exoplanet, LHS 475b. It's located 41 light years away from Earth and is approximately the same size as our planet. According to NASA, nowadays, James Webb is the only operating telescope capable of categorizing the atmosphere of Earth-sized exoplanets. The research team behind the discovery believes such results underline the precision of the telescope. They hope that it will help us locate many more rocky exoplanets that we might be able to colonize in the future. Even though, at first sight, it may seem that the universe is pretty empty, it's actually a very busy place. And Webb has all the necessary instruments to see all kinds of cosmic events happening out there. Just look at this image of WR-124. It's a star on the cusp of its explosive demise. In the image, the star is about to go supernova. It happens when a star runs out of its fuel and explodes at the end of its life cycle, releasing a giant cloud of space dust and hot gas into space. The star captured by the Webb telescope was at the wolf rayet stage of its life. That's a period when a star is shedding its outer layers before going supernova. The next amazing thing discovered by James Webb is a star-planet hybrid with very strange clouds. This bizarre world, VHS 1256b, is actually a brown dwarf. Those are bigger than planets but too small to classify as stars. They emit some light of their own and are quite hot. But their mass is simply not enough to fuse hydrogen into helium like full-fledged stars do. Space bodies of this kind aren't actually brown. They occur in a wide variety of colors, but those are mostly invisible to the human eye. What we can see is the light they emit, and to us, it appears to be dark orange or magenta. The brown dwarf discovered by the Webb telescope is almost 20 times the size of Jupiter. It orbits two red dwarf stars, and to complete one orbit, it needs over 10,000 years. Astronomers first found out about this unusual exoplanet in 2016, but at that time, they didn't classify it as a brown dwarf and, thus, couldn't explain its puzzling reddish glow. Now, thanks to the James Webb Telescope, they know the space object's origin. Anyway, back to those clouds. As you know, clouds on Earth are made of water vapor, but those on the brown dwarf are different. They seem to be made of... sand. It looks like good old sand from Earth, but it's actually not. The clouds are made of tiny particles of silicate. Another recent discovery involves several large galaxies that scientists believe were born not long after the Big Bang. They aren't supposed to be there, and no one expected to find them. But the James Webb Space Telescope has spotted them. These galaxies, as massive as our home Milky Way, are full of mature red stars. Astronomers have analyzed the light coming from them and estimated their age 5 to 700 million years after the Big Bang. It means that they came into being when our universe was very young, almost a baby. But the most bizarre thing about these galaxies is their tremendous size and the age of the stars dwelling there. The data received by the telescope don't coincide with the existing ideas about what the universe looked like and how it evolved in its early years. It also doesn't match the earlier observations made by Hubble. And here, James Webb has captured a distant region of space in unprecedented detail. This section of space is known as Pandora's Cluster. In the image, you can see three massive clusters of galaxies coming together and forming a mega cluster. The combined mass of these clusters acts as a powerful gravitational lens. And thanks to this natural magnification effect, scientists can see other galaxies in the region. Astronomers claim that the most recent image of Pandora's cluster is stronger and deeper than they have ever seen. James Webb has also managed to spot thousands of young stars never seen before in the Tarantula Nebula. This space formation got its nickname because of the appearance of dusty filaments spotted in previous images. It's the biggest star-forming region in the local group which includes the galaxies nearest to the Milky Way. 
The Webb Telescope's images have helped to shed light on the composition of the Tarantula Nebula. The telescope has also detected protostars, infant stars in the process of gaining mass. Astronomers expect that these protostars will eventually form and shape the nebula further. Among other discoveries made by the James Webb Telescope, you can see the birth of 50 distant stars. Some of them power protoplanetary disks, which might later form solar systems light years away from our own. Here's one more image from James Webb. You can see a supermassive black hole that has a mass of 9 billion suns. It's so ginormous and ancient that scientists are struggling to explain its existence. Astronomers have also discovered a distant ring of dust, rock, and gas that contains a chemical called methylcation. It's known as a molecular building block of life, and it makes most of the organic material on our planet. James Webb helped researchers see powerful sandstorms on a planet 235 trillion miles away. Astronomers were happy to discover this treasure chest of countless tiny sand particles. Now look at this. Do you recognize this image? Those are the so-called pillars of creation. But this new view shows us just how star-speckled that dusty region actually is. You can compare the new photo with the one taken by Hubble in 2014. This is astonishing proof of scientific progress. See this? You're looking at the best full portrait of the sun by far. Thankfully, our 4.5 billion year old parent star didn't use any makeup to fix its skin tone before this photo shoot. And now, we can study its surface in great detail. This iconic image was taken in March 2022. NASA wanted to gain a better understanding of solar behavior and its impact on life on Earth, and the future of our space technologies, of course. To do so, they launched the Solar Dynamics Observatory Satellite, or SDO, mission in February 2010. This legendary photo shoot happened 12 years later, when SDO was halfway between the Earth and the Sun. Scientists had to assemble 25 individual images like a puzzle. So the final image contains 83 million pixels. Yeah, the resolution is about 10 times better than your fancy 4K TV screen. Look at this amazing cookie-like pattern. Typically, the bright surface of the Sun overshadows it when we observe the star from Earth. Thankfully, NASA explored the light beyond the visible range, which allowed them to discover some invisible details of the sun's face. When you adjust your selfie with filters and effects, you can end up with completely different portraits, highlighting different spots of your face, even those you didn't know existed. Hmm. The same principle works here. All these plasma balls are the same photo of the sun captured at different electromagnetic wavelengths. The revealed spots and patterns can help us understand events happening inside the sun's skin a little better. At the speed of light is supposed to mean super quick. But this rose gold ray caressing your cheek at dawn has come a long way and is incredibly old in human terms. Photons generated by the sun's core take between 10,000 to 170,000 years to travel through the star's atmosphere, and then around 8 minutes more to reach Earth. So let's explore what's taking them so long. Our tour begins with the upper layer of the sun's atmosphere. Remember solar deities in movies and theater plays? They often wear luxurious crowns with golden rays. Well, the real sun does wear a fancy corona too, which is the outer layer of its atmosphere. But of course, its size and glory are incomparable with those plastic costume crowns. And its shape is not so stable. Corona is a gas shell enveloping our parent star, so its size and form constantly fluctuate under the influence of the sun's magnetic field. You can spot this crown with the naked eye from Earth during total solar eclipses. It looks like a beautiful, intense radiation around the solar disk, which itself is completely blocked by the Moon. The corona stretches 5 million miles above the sun's surface, whereas our blue planet is only about 8,000 miles in diameter. So, one hypothetical ray of the corona equals a row of about 625,000 Earth-sized planets. And suddenly, all my problems begin to seem tiny. Now here's another fun fact. The sun's corona kind of breaks the laws of known physics because it's hotter than it should be. Its temperature reaches 2 million degrees Fahrenheit, whereas the surface of the sun is only about 9,000 degrees. Although, the word only doesn't fit here, because it's still super warm in human terms. 
Usually, temperature tends to fall as you move farther from a heat source. But it's not the case here. Space scientists are still scratching their heads trying to investigate this mystery. Thankfully, the recent photo shoot allows us to explore what's going on inside this massive hot stuff without risking losing our sight. Take these beautiful bright spots, for example. They depict solar flares happening under the corona layer. Solar flares are powerful explosions that happen when magnetic fields bump into each other. When it happens, they change shape and quickly reorganize. These fields arise from plasma, which is very turbulent itself, so these events are no surprise for the local weather. Now, who would have thought that the sun has dark spots on its skin, just like people? These darker areas are known as coronal holes. Earthlings can experience their impact when they observe the beautiful aurora lights in the polar regions. Coronal holes look darker because plasma in these spots is cooler, less dense, and magnetically open. These conditions allow the solar winds to escape outward across the solar system rather than hang out at the sun's surface. And when they bump into the Earth's magnetosphere, auroras emerge to fascinate our eyes. Thankfully, the local fields cool down the solar winds. Nobody wants their eyes to melt, right? Now, if we were looking for an analogy to the sun's hairs, the best candidate would be solar prominences. These large, bright plasma loops arise from the sun's surface and stretch for thousands of miles into space. Their lifespan varies from days to several months. It's one of the most common events in this region. Although the first detailed description of solar prominence dates to the 14th century, modern scientists are still researching how and why they're formed. Diving further inwards, we're facing the transition region. The thickness of this layer is about 62 miles, and the local weather is unthinkable. <laughs> Temperatures can rise up to 900,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The transition layer sits between the corona and the last region of the sun's atmosphere, called the chromosphere. Now, speaking of which, welcome to our next stop. The chromosphere region is famous for a scientific mystery called a spicule. Come on, say it with me. Spicule. Yeah, that's fun. These spectacular grassy-like jets of plasma fire upwards from the surface of the sun and reach speeds of approximately 224 miles per second, as if they're jumping on a trampoline from the surface of the sun. Each spicule lasts for just a few minutes in outer space before falling back into the solar atmosphere. Astronauts were having a challenging time trying to explain how magnetically charged particles could manage to escape the massive gravity of the sun while being so close to it. The possible answer emerged in 2017. A group of scientists discovered that neutral particles provided the magnetically charged particles with extra buoyancy to escape the solar gravity for a while. Which is better than my cousin's explanation, which is happy thoughts and pixie dust. Yeah. Now let's go ahead and travel 1,000 miles inward toward the chromosphere to finally reach the solar surface, the photosphere. It's around 248 miles thick. But unlike planet Earth, the sun's surface is not solid or stable at all. The temperatures here are insanely hot for any matter to exist. On the other hand, scientists often call plasma the fourth state of matter. And why not? It's made of ionized atoms and free electrons, so it kind of deserves to matter. So what's the matter? <laughs> Maybe someday we'll happen to meet the local civilization of plasmoid people. But I think it's best that we skip their welcoming warm hugs. You know, hot, hot, hot. Anyway, the photosphere is our final stop because humankind doesn't have the technology to explore the sun any deeper. So if you want to learn more, you'll have to invent your own spacecraft. But time's a wasting. You'll only have about 7 to 8 billion years. After that, our sun will fade away, according to scientists' estimates. Actually, those same scientists will be going first. Now you have a serious competitor, though. NASA's Parker Solar Probe is the current champion for the deepest dive into the sun. The spacecraft managed to travel 4.5 million miles from the sun's surface toward its core on September 27, 2023. And then the Parker Probe repeated its own record once again in December of the same year. So why didn't it melt, I hear you asking? The probe has been designed to withstand insanely intense conditions and temperature fluctuations. It's equipped with a custom heat shield and an autonomous system protecting the mission from the massive solar lights. NASA has further ambitious plans. In December 2024, 
Parker will make its closest approach to the Sun. It will travel faster than any man-made object has ever traveled, at the speed of 435,000 miles per hour. The probe will be just 3.8 million miles away from the Sun's glowing hot surface. It's like landing on a star. Astronomers have already compared this epic upcoming milestone with the moon landing. I'm thinking, however, it might be safer if we, you know, landed at night. Yeah, you're right, that's an old joke. Ah, space. The final frontier. It's a vast and mysterious expanse that has fascinated us for centuries. But as much as we've learned about it, there are still plenty of things that we've been lied to about when it comes to space. Let's take a look at some of the biggest lies we've been told about this topic. First off, we have the idea that space is just this pristine, untouched wilderness. But that's not exactly true. We've been littering space with our debris for decades. Everything from old satellites to rocket parts. In fact, there are over 20,000 pieces of debris orbiting Earth right now, and they're causing all sorts of problems for future space missions. So if you're planning on visiting space anytime soon, watch where you go. You never know what kind of garbage might be floating around. Did you know that the sun is not actually yellow? It's green. Well, kind of. You see, scientists measure the temperature of a star by the color spectrum it emits. Cooler stars appear red, while the hottest of stars look blue. Our sun emits most of its energy at a wavelength that's close to green. But because it emits other wavelengths too, all these colors mix together and your eyes see this vibrant mixture as white. From Earth, however, the sun looks yellow because our atmosphere is really good at scattering blue light. If our star was actually yellow, Earth would become a frozen rock and we'd all be polar bears. Plus, the sun isn't on fire for real. It's a big ball of gas, mostly made of hydrogen and helium, and it works more like a gigantic nuclear reactor, constantly fusing hydrogen atoms to create helium inside its core. This process releases enormous amounts of energy. That's why the sun is so hot. Oh, and speaking of setting things on fire, explosions in space aren't real. Sorry, Star Wars fans, a spaceship can't go down in a violent blast because there is no air out there in space. No air means no oxygen, and no oxygen means no fire. Now, you might also think that there are too many stars in the night sky for you to count, but in fact, you can do that. According to the Yale Bright Star Catalog, there are 9,110 stars that you can see from Earth with the unaided eye. So, technically, you can count them, but I wouldn't be surprised if you lost count. And if you're worried about flying through an asteroid belt, don't be. Although it does have trillions of space rocks that range in size from space dust to a quarter of the size of the Moon, they're very spread out. The asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter is 140 million miles across, which is one and a half times the distance between Earth and the Sun. This spreads space rocks thousands of miles apart, making it almost impossible for a spacecraft to collide with one. You'll instantly freeze in space without a suit. Nope, you won't turn into a popsicle right away. It's going to take a bit longer than that because heat and cold don't really move very quickly in the vacuum of space. But unfortunately for you, there's a bigger problem at hand. You won't be able to breathe. After just 15 seconds, your brain won't be getting enough oxygen from your blood, and you'll pass out. And then, after just two minutes, it's curtains for the rest of your organs. So, in short, if you find yourself playing astronaut without a spacesuit, it's game over pretty quickly. Did you know that space doesn't have any temperature at all? That's because the temperature is defined by the speed at which particles move and the amount of energy they have. In the true vacuum of space, there are no particles to move around, making it temperatureless. Of course, some parts of space are really hot, like areas around stars. But the further away you get from stars, the more spread out particles are, making those areas of space pretty chilly. Number 9 is our planet's shape. No, it's not flat, but it's not a perfect sphere either. 
Yeah, it bulges at the equator because of our planet's wild spin. It's like Earth is doing its own little dance. And because of this bulging, launching spaceships from the equator is much easier than from the poles. Now, when it comes to sound in space, it's a bit of a tricky situation. You might think that no one can hear you scream, but that's not entirely accurate. The thing is, sound needs something to travel through, like air or water. In space, things are super spread out, so all those epic space battles and galactic explosions would be completely silent. Yet there are some places in space with enough particles for sound to travel through. For example, you can hear the black hole at the center of the Perseus Galaxy Cluster. Another myth is about zero gravity. That's not a thing. There's still some gravity hanging around the International Space Station, about 90% of what we feel on good old Earth. But astronauts get to float around because they're basically free-falling around the planet. And let's be real, Hollywood's version of space travel is not factual. Sure, orbits are a thing, but different altitudes mean different speeds, so moving from one orbit to another isn't exactly a walk in the park. You can't just push yourself in the right direction and hope for the best, you gotta take those orbital velocities into account. This reminded me of the 2013 movie Gravity and how Sandra Bullock tried to survive in space. Hollywood sure added some fuel to these myths, yet again, who can blame them? Back in 1976, NASA's Viking 1 spacecraft snapped a photo of a curious rock formation on Mars that looked suspiciously like a face. Some folks out there claimed that it must have been proof of extraterrestrial life on the Red Planet, but NASA had a different take. According to the space agency, the face was nothing more than a bunch of rocks piled up in such a way that the shadows they cast created an illusion of facial features. It turns out it was just a regular hill that got a little too much credit for being photogenic. The solar system stays in place. Lie! It's zooming through space at a speed of 140 miles per second, which means that it's whizzing through the cosmos faster than a cheetah chasing its prey. It takes us 230 million years for the solar system to complete a full orbit around the Milky Way. It's a good thing it isn't getting a speeding ticket, because that would be one astronomical fine, eh? Without the sun, planets would be pretty chilly. We're talking about temperatures as low as negative 455 degrees Fahrenheit. Brr. But with the sun around, the planets get to enjoy much more livable temperatures. Of course, not all planets are created equal. Mercury, for example, is the closest to the sun. Venus, on the other hand, is farther away, but somehow manages to be even hotter than Mercury. The distance from the Sun isn't the only factor that affects a planet's temperature. Other things like the planet's size and reflectivity also come into play. So Mercury being the hottest planet in our solar system is a false proposition. No, just because it's the closest one to the Sun doesn't mean it's the hottest. Even though we've been deceived in some ways, that doesn't make space any less amazing. It's still a vast, beautiful, and utterly fascinating part of our universe. And there's still so much we have yet to discover. Who knows, maybe one day we'll really discover little green people out there. Or maybe we'll find out something even more incredible. Until then, we'll just have to keep dreaming and exploring. There, you got 14 things on our list. Do you have any other space myths to debunk? If an asteroid like Apophis hits Earth, we will be destroyed. Massive earthquakes will strike. And tsunamis will flood everything. Apophis is a billion-year-old celestial body that has been in the solar system since its inception. So, you might be thinking, well, how likely is it that this giant space stone will collide with our planet in 2029? Well, let's find out, shall we? Apophis is a big, bad asteroid discovered in 2004 by the Kitt Peak National Observatory in Arizona. Since then, it has proudly held the title of one of the most dangerous asteroids ever located. It's around 1,100 feet wide, which is a bit bigger than the Empire State Building and the Eiffel Tower. 
Because of how scary it is, it was named Apophis, like the Egyptian immortal creature that was considered to bring eternal darkness and destruction to Earth. Oh boy! In 2021, researchers had a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to study this floating rock when it passed near our planet. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Now, some scientists say that there is a small chance of Apophis hitting the Earth on Friday, April 13, 2029. The Yarkovsky effect is to blame for this, since it can slightly nudge the space rock towards Earth. This effect originates from the uneven emission of thermal photons from a rotating celestial object, resulting in a fascinating force exerted upon it in space. These emitted photons possess momentum and play a pivotal role in shaping the dynamics of the body. The asteroid has two sides, light and dark, just like the moon. The light side faces the sun and is warmer than the dark side. But the thing also turns, so the sides constantly change direction and temperature. This change could be detrimental because it slightly pushes Apophis toward Earth. Unfortunately, nobody knows how the Yakovsky effect will influence the asteroid's path. On the other hand, on the asteroid's last flyby of Earth in 2021, astronomers used radar to take accurate measurements of its trajectory and confidently concluded Apophis will safely miss Earth in 2029 by about 20,000 miles and won't bother us again for at least 100 years. Now, generally speaking, every 8,000 years, our planet is hit by a falling star that has similar dimensions to those of Apophis. The last time we were hit by a slightly smaller meteor was in 2013. A new spacecraft developed by NASA called the OSIRIS-REx was launched in 2016 to collect samples from another slightly less terrifying celestial body called Bennu. Four years later, it finally arrived at the thing, got some samples, quickly said goodbye to Bennu, and started traveling back towards Earth. The samples were safely stored in a capsule dropped in Utah. So far, this has been the most significant sample ever taken from an asteroid. After the delivery, the spacecraft didn't waste any time and started chasing Apophis. Now, OSIRIS-REx has been renamed to OSIRIS-APEX and is currently playing tag with Apophis. With some luck, on the 2nd of April, 2029, when the asteroid zips close by Earth, the spacecraft will reach Apophis and land on it. It will stay on Apophis for 18 months, collecting valuable information and taking thousands of pictures. The asteroid will be monitored with the help of powerful telescopes. At some point, Apophis will get too close to the Sun, and then all the monitoring work will be on Osiris's apex back. If you live in Europe, West Asia, or Africa, you're one of those lucky people who will have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to see Opophis with the unaided eye. It'll be visible in the sky in these regions in 2029, and those who have telescopes will be able to spot it once again in 2036. Osiris Apex will experience some problems because the asteroid has a thick crust, and the spacecraft won't be able to collect data as easily as it did with Bennu. Osiris Apex has a unique thruster that will blow all the dust from Apophis while landing. This will be a perfect chance to analyze the surface of the asteroid to see what it's made of. The craft will spend one and a half years mapping the asteroid, trying to detect changes in its shape. All this research will show how the celestial body is likely to move so we can better design plans to protect Earth from such things. In 2025, NASA is also going to launch the mission Apophis Pathfinder, and it will be the first spaceship to ever touch this asteroid. It will land approximately a year after its launch. Also, NASA has proposed sending a swarm of tiny craft into space to help humanity develop effective protective tactics against asteroid strikes. We know that Apophis originated in the primary asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. In the past million years, this celestial body has changed its path because of the considerable influence of Jupiter's gravitation. Now it seems like it favors the Sun more, meaning this asteroid will come very close to Earth. That's why it's classified as a near-Earth celestial body. A lot of tests and research have been done to find a way to deal with asteroids. So 
Some solutions include drilling and detonating the space body from inside, or testing new technologies, like attaching rockets to it and trying to steer it away from Earth. We can also hit it with something moving at high speeds to make it change its course. Apophis is an S-type asteroid made of rocks and minerals like iron and nickel, and is shaped like a peanut. It can tell us a lot about the past and possibly the future. Sampling this space object could reveal how life on Earth began and how plants appeared. There are many theories that suggest that water arrived on our planet on an asteroid or a comet. Asteroids are like priceless time capsules. Unlike rocks on Earth, which have undergone thousands of changes, like erosion, most celestial bodies are still intact and much easier to study. When meteors fall on Earth, they get covered in debris that's impossible to clean. That's why studying Apophis while it's still in space is so important. Also, some asteroids are made of precious metals like platinum. Right now, we have a high demand for metals that we use in production, and mining metals on Earth is quite tricky. Just one large meteor might have iron, nickel, gold, and platinum that could last us millions of years. If Apophis has this amount of metals, well, we'd want to break it down and bring it back to Earth. One space rock could be worth quadrillions of dollars, making space mining highly profitable. And still, it would cost us more to get it back to Earth than to dig up these materials here. As technology progresses and new kinds of rockets are developed, this might become possible at some point. So, even though we're safe for the next 100 years from Apophis, you probably still want to see what would happen if something like it did impact. Come on, sure you do. Well, first let me tell you, you'll hear the sound of the collision and know what's happened even if you're miles away. You should leave your house or apartment immediately. Shortly after the impact, massive earthquakes will strike, and many tall buildings will fall. So staying away from cities might be your best option if you have a choice. But don't escape by car. There will be massive traffic jams, and everyone will panic. Going on foot or by bike is your best option in this scenario. A prime way of transportation will be traveling by plane. So if you've always wanted to get that pilot license, now you've got a good excuse. If you have time, take along extra snacks and water and an extra pair of socks. It's nice to live by the ocean or the sea, but in this scenario, it's the worst place to be because giant tsunami waves will hit coastlines after the impact. If you live far away from the impact area, the tsunami might take 30 hours to arrive. You'll have a bit of time to prepare. The protective shield of our planet decays and eventually fails. So do our satellites. First, communication satellites in the highest orbits go down. Next, astronauts in low Earth orbit can no longer contact their mission control center. And finally, hazardous, relentless cosmic rays start bombarding everything on Earth, causing havoc and devastation. Are these the terrifying consequences of the planet's magnetic field reversal we're going to face? Right now, as you're watching this video, Earth's north magnetic pole is extremely out of whack. It's so serious that scientists will have to update the global magnetic field model released a mere four years ago. Does it all mean that the magnetic pole of our planet will flip soon? Well, be patient, we'll figure it out a bit later. You see, the magnetic pole is moving quite erratically from the Canadian Arctic towards Siberia. And these movements are very unpredictable. But it's normal for the pole to be moving. There are long-term records from London and Paris that prove that the North Magnetic Pole moves randomly around the rotational North Pole over periods of several hundred years. But the most astonishing thing about its movement is that it's speeding up. Around the mid-1990s, the magnetic pole unexpectedly accelerated from a bit over 9 miles to 34 miles a year. And recently, the pole crossed the international dateline, moving toward the eastern hemisphere. The European Space Agency launched extremely accurate magnetic field satellites in 2013. Thanks to them, researchers have superb data they can use not only to make magnetic field maps, but also to update them every 6 to 12 months. 
That's how they were able to notice that the core field was weakening, too. It might be a sign that the planet's magnetic field is about to flip. To understand this process better, we need to figure out how the core field works. Let's say we've got a bar magnet that runs through the center of our planet and has a north and a south pole. This magnet is incredibly strong, representing about 75% of the intensity of our planet's magnetic field at the surface. Our bar magnet is not only moving, but is also getting weaker, by about 7% every century. Admittedly, this bar isn't the perfect representation of the core field. It's more like electric currents generating Earth's magnetic field. Still, this model makes it easier to see what's happening to our planet now. The magnetic field of our planet plays an important role in protecting us from dangerous radiation and geomagnetic activity, which is the product of the interaction between the solar wind and Earth's magnetosphere. Earth's magnetic field also moves. Scientists have been studying and tracking the movement of the magnetic poles for hundreds of years. The historical motions of these poles indicates changes in the global geometry of the magnetic field of our planet. And they may point to the beginning of the field reversal, too. That's what the flip between the north and south magnetic poles is sometimes called. You see, if the north magnetic pole moves a bit, it isn't a big deal. But a complete reversal might have a serious impact on the climate of our planet, as well as modern technology. Luckily, such flips don't happen overnight. The entire process stretches over thousands of years. Plus, even though the magnetic pole weakens during a pole reversal, it doesn't disappear completely. So those scary events from the beginning of the video aren't likely to happen to us. The magnetosphere will continue protecting the planet from cosmic rays and charged solar particles, even though there might be some amount of particulate radiation that will make it to Earth's surface. Magnetic fields are generated by moving electric charges. If some material allows these charges to easily move in it, it's called a conductor. Metal is a great conductor, and we often use it to transfer electric currents from one place to another. In this case, the electric current is negative charges, called electrons, moving through the metal. The current is what generates a magnetic field. Earth has a liquid iron core. In other words, there are layers and layers of conducting material inside our planet. Currents of charges are constantly moving through the core, and the liquid metal is also moving and circulating there, generating the magnetic field. This magnetic field, in turn, produces something resembling a bubble around the planet. It's called the magnetosphere, and it's located above the uppermost part of the atmosphere. This layer shields and deflects high-energy cosmic radiation, which otherwise would be extremely dangerous to people and other forms of life on Earth. The magnetosphere also interacts with the ionosphere, the layer of our planet's atmosphere containing loads of ions and free electrons and capable of reflecting radio waves. The interaction between these two layers and the magnetized solar winds is what scientists call space weather. The solar wind is normally mild, and there's no space weather whatsoever. But sometimes, the sun starts shedding gargantuan magnetized clouds of gas that can accelerate to incredible speeds. They're called coronal mass ejections, or CMEs. They're ejected from the sun over the course of several hours. CMEs usually look like giant twisted ropes and can occur spontaneously. Their frequency varies according to the 11-year-long solar cycle. For example, at a solar minimum, you can observe one ejection per day. And when the sun is in its most active phase, there might be three CMAs per day. Coronal mass ejections disrupt the calm flow of the solar wind and cause serious disturbances that can damage stuff, both in space near Earth, like satellites, and on the planet's surface. If coronal mass ejections make it to Earth, their interaction with the magnetosphere generates geomagnetic storms. Those can trigger auroras, happening when a stream of energized particles hits the atmosphere and lights up. And then there are also solar flares. They develop more rapidly and with much more energy than coronal mass ejections. Solar flares often occur soon after coronal mass ejections. The most powerful volcanic eruptions pale in comparison to solar flares that release 10 million times more energy. 
Within a few minutes, one solar flare can give out billions of tons of charged particles. Solar flares are also insanely hot, with temperatures reaching several million degrees Fahrenheit. Astronomers believe that such bursts of solar radiation happen when the sun's magnetic field gets twisted in some regions. At one moment, all the pent-up energy is released. The star sends out light and particles, mostly electrons and protons. Most solar flares last for minutes, but some continue for hours. A powerful solar storm can potentially cause a devastating global blackout on Earth. If not for the Earth's magnetosphere, the effects of the sun's activity would be much more devastating. Luckily, the magnetosphere deflects most of the solar material hurtling towards our planet from our star at a speed of over 1 million miles per hour. But even so, during space weather events, there's a lot of hazardous radiation near Earth. It can potentially harm astronauts and spacecraft. Plus, space weather can damage large conducting systems, for example, pipelines and power grids, by overloading currents running inside them. Scientists regularly map and track the overall orientation and shape of our planet's magnetic field. To do it, they use local measurements of the field's orientation and magnitude. That's why they've been able to conclude that the location of the North Magnetic Pole has moved by almost 600 miles since the first measurements were taken in 1831. The magnetic field of our planet reverses on a time scale varying between 100,000 to 1 million years. One can tell how often it happens by looking at volcanic rocks at the bottom of the ocean. They capture the orientation and strength of Earth's magnetic field at the time of their creation. So, dating those rocks gives us a good picture of how our planet's magnetic field has evolved over time. From a geological point of view, field reversals happen quite fast, but they are extremely slow from a human perspective. A complete reversal normally takes a couple of thousand years, but during this time, the orientation of the magnetosphere may shift, exposing more of Earth to cosmic radiation. Such events tend to change the concentration of ozone in the atmosphere. In any case, scientists can't say for sure when the next field reversal will happen. But they keep mapping and tracking the movement of our planet's magnetic north. By the way, the Earth isn't the only planet with a magnetic field. Gas giants, like Jupiter, also have a conducting metallic hydrogen layer that generates their magnetic fields. Jupiter's internal magnetic field prevents the solar wind from interacting directly with the planet's atmosphere.